Tatsalach, Liloitza, good afternoon. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Beth Piatote, and I'm, the associate, I'm an associate professor of comparative literature and English and director of the Arts Research Center. Uh, welcome to everybody. I hope everybody's had a chance to grab something to eat and settle in. I'm going to go ahead and start with our introductions today. It's my great joy to introduce our program today. Um, today's program is the third in a series of five informal gatherings to welcome new arts faculty to campus. Uh, please grab a flyer or one of these beautiful bookmarks to remind you of these um, upcoming events. We have two more after this. Also, I want to um, put Leanne, sorry, Luann, Red Eye on the spot. She uh, is new faculty here, Luann, who made the who allowed us to use her beautiful artwork for our posters. So thank you, Luann. Luann's program was um, in November, and uh, some of the earlier programs will, are available on our website, so you can catch up with those. Uh, but get some food first so that you get the full experience of of the loft hour. So the goal of the Loft Hour is to nourish our community in every way, with food, with friendship, with conversation. It's to elevate our new faculty, and it's also to elevate our whole community, to elevate our day. Our program today features Somal Sharif of the English Department and Darian Longmire of Art Practice in conversation with Annika Lenson from the History of Art. We're grateful to the Office of the Dean of Arts and Humanities for generous support of this program. Um, I will introduce Annika, and then she will introduce our two speakers. They will each share briefly, and then we'll have time for a little bit of conversation, and then you'll be out the door back to your day. So um, Annika Lenson is a longtime uh, affiliate of the Arts Research Center, currently an associate professor of global modern art. She specializes in modern painting and contemporary visual practices with a focus on the cultural politics of the Middle East. Her research examines problems of artistic representation in relation to the globalizing imaginaries of empire, nationalism, communism, decolonization, non-alignment, and third world humanism. Professor Lesson is the author of Beautiful Agitation, Modern Painting and Politics in Syria, which won the 2021 Syrian Studies Association Best Book Prize and was shortlisted for the MSA Book Prize. She's also co-editor with colleagues Nada Shabu and Sarah Rogers of a volume of art writing from the Arab world in translation. Modern Art in the Arab World, Primary Documents, published by the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Professor Lenson asked me to cut short her bio, but I could go on with her awards, foundations, amazing um, work that she's done. Please check out our website to learn more about Annika's amazing work. Thank you, Annika. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Beth, and um, what a pleasure to um, be here to be in conversation with the brilliant colleagues. Um, and my role is to simply facilitate. So I will um, introduce Solmaz Sharif. Solmaz Sharif is the Shirley Schenker Assistant Professor of English at UC Berkeley. Born in Istanbul to Iranian parents, she's the author of Customs. Grey Wolf Press 2022 and Look Grey Wolf Press 2016, a finalist for the National Book Award. She holds degrees from UC Berkeley where she studied and taught with June Jordan's Poetry for the People and New York University. Her work has appeared in Harper's, the Paris Review, Poetry, the Kenyan Review, the New York Times and, and many others. Her work has been recognized with a Discovery Boston Review Poetry Prize uh, Rona Jaffe Foundation Writers Award and Holmes National Poetry Prize from Princeton University. She has received fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, Lannan Foundation, and Stanford University. Please welcome Solmaz. Thank you, Solmaz, for those. Um, eviscerating and visceral 
Holmes. I'd now like to um, introduce Darian Longmire. Darian Longmire is a mixed media artist from Chicago, Illinois, and assistant professor in the Department of Art Practice here at UC Berkeley. After moving from the Midwest to the Northeast, Darian began to combine his print-based work, which explored physics, philosophy, and outer space, with wider ideas about time and space. Eventually discovering the close connection to sci-fi and techno-culture, his research and ideas from the past have developed into a larger artistic framework. His recent explorations in the studio have been impacted by what he describes as living through a time distortion. Darian has exhibited works in a number of shows, including Yelling at the Sky, curated by Lakeisha Leak at the Gaylord and Donnelly Foundation in Chicago, Illinois, Time Camp, curated by Black Quantum Futurism at Icebox Projects in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, as well as What is Leaping in Your Chest, curated by Alexandra Foradas um, of Mass Mocha at Collar Works Gallery in Troy, New York. Please welcome. Yeah. Okay. Um, so thank you to Saul Mass for that amazing reading. Thank you to the Arts and Research Center for uh, supporting me. I'm very happy to be here today. Um, and so I'm a professor in the art practice department here at UC Berkeley. Um, I'm a professor of expanded printmaking. Uh, and what that means is, um, as early as my undergrad, when I first started uh, and discovered that I was an artist, uh, and I was training classically in art making and uh, printmaking, um, I was a student who was under-resourced. Under um, so uh, I often had to choose between art materials and food. So I was a student who was um, dealing with financial instability, housing instability, and also I was a, sur a survivor of domestic violence. So. When I did my undergrad, I was um, I was I couldn't call my parents <laughs> to ask for support, and so as I was discovering um, my journey as an artist and studying printmaking, I had no choice but to be resourceful and to sort of search in my environment um, as I was being so, sort of classically trained as an artist during undergrad, and so a lot of my current uh, journey into teaching printmaking here at UC Berkeley has been about inventing new ways of thinking about printmaking and inventing new approaches to thinking about um, my point of view for uh, printmaking. And so that is just sort of, that contextualizes what's just been on my mind um, for the past seven months. I relocated here from the East Coast, even though I grew up in Chicago. And so what I've done is relocate a studio practice that has been going on for about eight to nine years. And I've, I'm sort of reacquainting myself with that work. Um, my work lived in a storage unit for three years as I was back and forth between upstate and Brooklyn. And it's really great to sort of set a uh, stable footing down here on the West Coast and to sort of start to think about new ideas in my studio practice. And so I'll share a few uh, images today and a few um, ideas of what I've been thinking through uh, in, in the studio. Um, so this is a picture of one of the first um, functional missiles that was created. Um, this was invented in 1944. And so 1944, for, for historical context, the Cold War is right around the corner. Uh, in the 1940s, there was also a genocide occurring. So it sort of uh, echoes what's sort of going on in our current moment today. And um, this missile, carried like a one ton uh, pound of explosives on it. And it was actually given its name, the Vengeance One Weapon, by the Nazi propaganda ministry. And so I share this image because um, space travel and outer space exploration is directly linked to imperialism, where usually when there's investments and explorations into space travel, there's also simultaneously like this um, the, the state, like there's this interest through war, right? Um, if we wouldn't know how to get into outer space if we didn't know how to build bombs. And so initially I thought that I was an Afrofuturist, um, but what I came to realize about my work is that I'm actually um, moving beyond that, if that makes sense. I'm, I'm asking myself uh, with these scientific 
images, but also my own personal interest in physics. Like, what does it really mean? Like, what, the poetics of space travel, if you will. And how can I use that to um, compare it to my own lived experience? Um, and so that's just an image of a, a weapon, essentially. Um, this image was taken in 1968, and this is actually during the Cold War. And this is the U.S. spying on Russia through satellite imagery. And, um, and so specifically, I think the U.S. is surveilling and spying on Russia at this time to spy on what they're trying to build to get to the moon. And so I was initially drawn to satellite imagery because I thought that it was like this thing that I was sort of reappropriating and taking and remixing for my own sort of cultural lived identity. But I came to understand that these satellite images are actually records of imperialist interests. They're um, records of surveillance, and they're also records of extraction, the extraction of data and uh, spying. Um, I think currently right now, I was just reading in the New York Times, Russia is sort of uh, threatening or maybe potentially that they're going to release the first nuclear uh, weapon into orbit. And so just thinking about how when there's wars happening on the Earth, there's also wars happening in the sky. And the celestial is this also this um, this place where it's not about fantasy, but like there's quite literally uh, imperialist interests and, and capitalist interests um, mm -hmm. taking place in outer space. And so it became this sort of permission for me to think about the, the political nature of that. Um, this is Elon Musk's SpaceX launch pad site. And this is a photograph after the aftermath of releasing an attempt to release a series of a rocket, I think, into outer space, a reusable rocket. And I share this image because I think I didn't realize how much damage and destruction my work was sort of touching on. I didn't realize it. But also this image is represent, representative of how much damage and um, impact it has on the Earth. But it it's also shows that like the incredible power of the bomb attached to the spacecraft and how it's a bomb going, in, going into outer space. And I, I've been thinking more and more about like my archive of prints uh, and printmaking were sometimes traditional and repeatable artists. But I think that I started to really question the precious nature of the print. And I started ripping and tearing and destroying prints as I saw society being destroyed during the pandemic and on and even worse today. And so I really just started to incorporate damage into my work, and I've been grappling with what, with what that means. This is um, an early work that I made in 2017, and uh, it's called the Cosmographic Flag, number one. And this image is great because, uh, first off, it's like seven feet tall, so it goes all the way up to like where the projector screen is there. And it's uh, an archival print on vinyl mesh. And this is a satellite image that at the time Relating to Afrofuturism, I was sort of taking these satellite images. This is a seismographic image that the satellite takes, and then it has to be composited back together. So I was taking these images and remixing them into the colors of the African diaspora, and I was sort of just, you know, NASA releases these images for free. And I was just sort of grappling with the satellite image as this formal object at first, right? And, and then I realized over time that the, it had this political meaning. Um, yes, seven feet tall by four feet across. Pretty, pretty, it was like a, sort of a, a breakthrough for me in my studio practice. Um, and so with these satellite images in my use of archival inkjet prints, the digital print, the digital print became a stand-in for printmaking for me as I was someone living at the time between Brooklyn, upstate New York, and I had no access to printmaking facilities, so I would use these uh, digital, this slide's kind of blurry, sorry. I would use these um, digital prints as a sort of stand-in and I was wheat pasting them essentially as this way of responding to my lived environment. Someone who grew up in the inner city then lived in Brooklyn, like the streets taught me how to paint. I didn't take a painting class ever. So I instead learned how to paint through my observed environment, specifically through wheat pasting and the, the deterioration of like these plas pl plywood abandoned storefronts in, in my neighborhood and in uh, Bushwick where I was living. And so uh, on the right or on the 
that's the left, right? There you go. Um, this is a satellite image that I ran through video software. It's of the continent of Africa. And then I pasted it down a few times, uh, sanding it, like really trying to almost erase the continent through like through this act of sanding and like er erasure on, the, on the, the left side. And then on the right side, that's the satellite image of the surface of Mars. And I printed it in, and it glitched and did this like pink striped thing. And then I just combined it with uh, acrylic. Uh, both of these paintings are 24 by 24 inches and they incorporate inkjet prints, acrylic, um, and maybe some silica sand that might be in one of those. Um, and these are two, once again, just early investigations of, with the satellite image. Um, this is a current in progress work for my studio. Uh, it's nowhere near finished, and I actually did not measure the size of it. But I've been continuing to explore these, um, the satellite image. But if you notice, this uh, image is actually the digital version of this painting. And so I do this thing where the work goes analog, or it goes digital to analog, and then it goes back into digital. And it's this way of having the work live in like two different dimensions at once just as I see within printmaking, the image kind of exists in two dimensions at once because in printmaking, there is this image matrix which contains the image and then you have to put ink in it and print it. And so the image actually exists in two, two dimensions at once. And so within this work, there is this uh, also this use of foam. And I've been thinking about this foam as a symbolic representation of myself and my own lived experience as I veer towards abstraction and creating a word of abstraction in my work. And so the foam is both, it, it starts out as liquid, but then it's solid. Uh, so it's sort of hybrid and it shape shifts. Um, the, the foam looks heavy, but it's extremely lightweight. And so it just reminds me of sort of like my own lived experience and how I sort of have remained agile and been able to pivot uh, while trying to survive as an artist. Um, and yeah, there's acrylic charcoal, probably some gouache in there. This is a solar plate print. And so that's where the expanded printmaking comes from, is I was taking my prints from my personal archive and then putting them in conversation with mixed media works and trying to figure out through almost like this collage sensibility of what that figure. Yeah, just trying to figure out how to make an image I've never seen before. This um, is, was created during 2020 and it's 16 by 20 inches. And this was the first work that I ever made where I felt like there was a breakthrough. It's a little bit dark here, unfortunately. It doesn't look that way on the screen. Um, but this was the first work where I ever started using the foam and then this collage sensibility, the satellite images. And then there's like a mono print hidden in here. There's reflective silica paper. There's satellite images that I've cut into. There's glitter, because I love a good glitter moment in my work. And there's a pastel, yeah, pastel, uh, 16 by 20. So this work is just like, it was the, the breakthrough that started what I call the seismic unrest series, which is my theory that like the magnetic currents of the earth, but also the seismic activity of the earth is directly correlated to political unrest. As we see, so every time there's wars breaking out, there's also earthquakes breaking out. And so I believe that there are galactic occurrences that directly relate to our um, actual experience here on the Earth. And this is just the last thing I'll share, um, an installation shot from my studio um, where I'm dealing with just drawing. And once again, you see like that satellite image sort of like dancing in the middle. Um, a lot of these works are made while I'm listening to techno or listening to podcasts or just thinking about some world I would like to be. Um, and uh, uh, specifically within the drawing on the left, it's just like a drawing of planet rings and they're just overlapping and the infinity symbol, which I view the infinity symbol as this, that kind of like time distortion we're in where I feel like time is not linear, but time is actually sloping and then undulating and repeating itself. Um, and yeah, just exploring mixed media and trying to create this cohesive visual language and abstraction. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's all I have for you today. And I thank everyone for being here.
So um, I want to thank both Darian and Somaz again for this extremely moving and um, honest and um, demanding work, actually, um, that you've given to us. And I'm going to keep it relatively short because I can see all of it's a full house and I'm sure there are a lot of questions. I wondered if maybe the first question to ask each of you, I was really struck when we got together to brainstorm what, how we wanted to use this time. Um, Salmaz, you identified yourself as a materialist <laughs> poet. And so I was listening actually to both presentations with th that question of the materials that you are working with, like how you would I identify or maybe characterize those materials. You, Darian, talked about images existing in multiple dimensions by virtue of moving between the digital and the analog. And you also spoke to us about how images and imaging processes are coming to you in a kind of sequence. So I'm, I'm really curious how you would characterize the material that is that you're maybe um, working with or following even in your work. And um, yeah, similarly, Salmaz, I'm really curious, you know, could track how the naming of things leave some feeling of craters. I'm trying to, again, think across the imagery and um, curious to hear more what being a materialist poet uh, really means for you, maybe even in terms of how you might be editing what you share. Sure. Yeah. No, thank you for that um, a question. And and um, I think uh, maybe, maybe I partially use that term in a kind of self-defensive or protective way, uh, which is to say I don't fancy myself a particularly imaginative poet or presence with or with a rich inner life where I'm inventing a world that I'm then kind of um, writing down. Instead, I've often referred to myself as a glorified stenographer where I'm going and I'm finding things and I'm putting them next to each other uh, where they're, they seemingly, you know, they don't necessarily belong next to each other. And, and, um, but I was thinking about, you know, the wheat pasting as a, as the, the learning of, of painting itself and what it means to learn the, what it means to learn a poetic sensibility or ear through the registers of language that delimit and, you know, malform my own life. Um, in the U.S. and and beyond, so through the the violent and dead rhetoric of the state, for example, um, in its negative space, I can see what the poetic would do in turn, and so that's been kind of instrumental to my own um, to my own teaching. Also, as somebody that's not, I don't turn toward beauty as much uh, as I would like. Um, I, I turn to what is and I feel should, shouldn't be. You know, I have that kind of moral uh, impulse uh, that I'm supposed to, to hide, but I, I have it. And, and uh, yeah, and through that, I kind of come up with, you know, what's missing, which is often a, a poetic sensibility. Yeah. yeah, I think the first time I ever thought about, like, I... I took like charcoal and rubbed it on these prints that I had made, which were like etching. So they took hours of labor mm -hmm. and I almost felt like there was something I was doing that was like forbidden or like wrong or kind of violent, like transgressing the print by rubbing charcoal. And so I tried to read the book, New Materialisms and that I, nothing like <laughs> it just hurt my brain. But I wonder if maybe, maybe now I figured, maybe now I figured out, um, what it means, but yeah. Mm. Yeah, I still am studying the materialism as a philosophical thing and mm. yeah, trying to understand it. Maybe I'll ask one more and then um, go to the questions, which is another maybe affinity in terms of the sensibility, both of what you each presented and then the work that was on offer is the, what the um, painfulness of the, Traveler, <laughs> um, Solmaz, and some of the um, poems that you read for us, we had that railing, this railing, um, and a, and as at least as I heard in the poem, a kind of squint that uh, of, of, of what a posture of viewing that that 
emerges or is co-produced with this kind of material barrier in a site of passage. And Darian, you, of course, give us the catastrophe and romance of the astronaut. Um, that's it, part of what you presented with the kind of disaster of uh, imagining one's ability to travel and the crater that's left behind. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, you know, if this is going to sound lame, answer it however you want. The role of the art historian is to put something out and you refuse. But, you know, do you, are, as you're writing, are you, are you the traveler or is it a kind of process of documenting the, the, the barriers to that? travel, I suppose, is the question of the, the working with that figure um, and what kind of relationship you feel you maybe forge in that way. Yeah. Um, I talk about the poetics of like space travel in terms of like an astronaut being able to survive being blasted up on a bomb into orbit and almost as this metaphor for what it's like to be an artist where like you quite literally it's like life and death in some ways where, you know, I, I put so much of my own livelihood on the line to be an artist, like, and, you know, foregoing gainful employment. And, and so I sort of see the ability to, you know, survive and go into outer space as a, a sort of metaphor for my own lived experience where, like, there are literally, literally days where, like, you know, like you have to face down death, especially, um, yeah, living as a marginalized person. Like, I think death is constantly something looming over? Um, trying to remember, the, the question was whether the I write as the traveler or, tell me, no? Yeah, or chronicle the... Baby. Or chronicle the stories. Yeah, I mean, I would say that some of the poems I read, the, the Dear Aleph poems, for example, I, I was looking at travelogues in particular, and I was thinking about Robert Hayden's American Journal that he writes out of the perspective of, you know, in the in a kind of persona of an alien that's landed on the U.S. and soil and is reporting back to to the counselors above, and and um, so sometimes I lean into that kind of ironizing that maybe, uh, but I would say that overall, um, Edward Said's work in representations of the intellectual around the exilic stance as an actual kind of uh, position of intellectual pursuit and understanding is something that really resonates with me and what it means to, he, he quotes Adorno saying, it's a part of morality to not, uh, not be at home in one's home, right? And so what it means to accept one's own, yes, material nomadic situation. In my case, I'm, I'm not speaking for Adorno or Said here who have their own relationships to exile, but, you know, never quite belonging, not being a part of a we, questioning all we's that I find myself in, you know, doing all of that kind of work. Uh, and then eventually, I suppose I could have devoted a, a poetry project that would try to write myself into a, you know, or create the we or find a place or whatever. And instead, I've, I've landed at a place where I think this is actually not only the just most materially true to myself and most materially true chronicle, but existentially and, and spiritually true of, of all of us. And um, the sooner as a, as a poet, I can accept that. And as a writer in English, I can accept that, that my allegiances are necessarily mm, um, false or created by happenstance or whatever the case may be and that I can I can constantly try to speak beyond or outside and and find what is not here what the crater that's left and not be distracted by the rocket right um to me that's all a part of of embracing the exilic stance mm -hmm. yeah Thank you. you up for questions from the from the I would I would love that if you have a question, raise your hand. Thanks. Um, thank you both so much for your discussion, and thank you, Anik, for moderating. One of the points of connection that I found so striking in this discussion is how um, both of you have used source material from the state and its emphasis on surveillance and transparency, but 
um, both of you also enact a kind of refusal and, and um, abstraction or obfuscation in that. So, so Maz, I'm thinking specifically in Look, how you use the military dictionary, um, but in but you know you find ways to work through that language, and often it's very personal, it's familial. So, um, in my favorite poem from that collection, Master Film, uh, you know it's you discuss. Um, your parents' respective journeys in in in, uh, in the U.S. Um, and the motif of uh, a film uh, uh, of your father's friend videotaping, and he's showing in that videotape a picture of you as a child. Um, but the end of that poem is, you know, your father saying, uh, "Point the camera away. I don't want to see. You know, it's, I don't want Solmas to see me cry." So that that kind of refusal there, and then Darian, the way that abstraction operates for you as you know taking these surveillance images, but then refusing to enact that sa same kind of um, you know deep, in almost intrusive look. You you have that kind of refusal that um, allows you to again move through these sort of technicalities and technocracies of the state but but do so on your own terms so i think constraint and and freedom are you know when you mentioned are you the traveler are you uh cataloging borders i think they're one and the same in so many ways i appreciate your comment um to me, refusal is also just related to like my queerness and my refusal to follow any type of expectation, right? And sort of, I think that I have this attitude with that as well with approaching printmaking where I want to think almost musically or improvisationally about the medium and about my approach. And, and I have no choice, it's life and death because I don't fit into society in any way, I'm not digestible. And so that's where it comes from for me. Um, I guess, you know, to speak to the example too, if I, if, if I were truly faithful to refusal, I wouldn't even write the poem. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think, um, how can I say this? I, I mean, I'm a research based poet. And I spend a lot of time looking directly at, uh, well, war in particular when I was working with the DOD or migration, borders, uh, transcripts from deportation cases and, you know, and I can, I can see just horrific detail after detail after detail and I can see the patterns between them. And, and, and at some point, um, the question for me becomes you know, I, I return to my central belief, which is that the poem is, and poetry itself is actually a mode of attention and of reading and not what is on the page. And maybe the poem here is offering a way of reading and the hope is that that reading continues off the page. Um, in which case I don't need to keep giving details, right? So that's where the refusal for me comes in. But in terms of um, representing or not representing, I, I, I lean more representational. I lean, I lean into the ethical mess and muck because I also know for me that the absence of looking has not worked, right? And uh, will not work. And turning away also will not work. And um, as overly saturated as we are, there has to be another way. And, and the way for me is an intervention on our mode of attention. And so that's what I keep trying and failing to, to get to. Thank you very much. Um, I'm curious, you're both academics and yet you're also a poet and an artist who's works can reach a much wider audience. How do you balance and how do you see your roles as academics versus artists trying to influence society? Um, I look at myself as a 
disruptor or like a, a punctuation of the space. I'm often the only person in, you know, the room and who comes from my experience. And so I think about how I have to no choice but to go the underway or to think outside the box mm -hmm. because I have to be able to, I just don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I, um, I, I love the idea of, for me, my life is a series of rooms, you know? and a series of microphones and, and ears. And I think that's true for all of us. And the rooms are different and the microphones are different. And, and um, I am, uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't see them as at odds, but I do have questions around what it has meant to come out of the kind of professionalizing forces of literary, creative writing, teaching, and the arts as well, right? Where we are prepared uh, and much, edu like much pedagogical kind of influence goes into writing the good poem on the page, but not much necessarily goes into why, you know? What is the point of the page? Where does it end? What do you understand your role, not only in the world, not only in the, but in history, right? And so, and the poets that I've always been drawn to have been, you know, distinctly and decidedly kind of unemployable, in fact, right? Um, so my, but my MO has always just been, I, I am, I am as I am in all the ways that I am. And I think that uh, poets are lucky and that we can kind of get away with that, you know? <laughs> Folks are expecting a little like unicorn activity to happen and so it's met with more um, generosity. But uh, the limits, yeah, the limits for me of both of those modes and mediums right now are distinctly actually political and material and in terms of very urgent questions of catastrophe that cannot be answered by the, the scope and the kind of time frame of these other pursuits that I haven't reconciled. Well, I, we, got the, we got the. So I, uh, this concludes, I suppose, the formal part where we're sitting at the microphone and um, folks can eat and continue speaking. <laughs> <laughs>